What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Before we get started, if you guys like this video, if it makes sense, please support us. One of the ways that you guys can do that is by hitting the like button, commenting down in the comment section, or subscribing. Please try to do that if you can. Also, if you guys want some amazing notes, some awesome illustrations that our team has whipped up together for you guys to follow along with me during this lecture, go down in the description box below. There's a link to our website. You'll find all that there. But Let's talk about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. If you guys haven't already, I would suggest that you watch the Hodgkin's lymphoma first before watching this lecture. I just think that that really builds on the base of what we're gonna talk about. And then we're gonna kind of recap a couple of things, talk about a lot of similarities, but also the differences between them. So first things first, when we talk about lymphoma in general, it's an abnormality within the lymphocyte pathway, right? So we have to quickly go over kind of how lymphocytes are formed, how they mature, where they go, all the different kind of phases that they'll move through throughout the lymph node. Then what we'll talk about is the different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So if you guys remember in Hodgkin's lymphoma, it was weird, there's not a ton of evidence, but there's a thought process that in some point in the lymphocyte development, at least it's in, in the germinal center, whether it's at the centroblast stage or the centrocyte stage, it's supposed to undergo apoptosis, but it doesn't. And it was because of the increase in the nuclear factor kappa beta from EBV or HIV or immunosuppressed states. In non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, there's different types of B-cell lymphomas, which is the most common type of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, the B-cell type non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And there's various different stages. So that's where there is a big difference between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. Non-Hodgkin's has a lot of different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, particularly of the B-cell flavor. So let's go over first the lymphocyte pathway, just kind of get an understanding of it. And then what we'll do is we'll dive into it a little bit more into the types, the causes, a lot of genetics that are involved in this. So the first thing that we have to start off with is that all like white blood cells are produced in the, the red bone marrow, right? So we start off in what's called the red bone marrow. And in the red bone marrow, you start off what's called a, a hematocytal, hemocytoblast or a pluripotent stem cell. And that's supposed to differentiate. And it differentiates into two different types of cells. One is a myeloid stem cell, which will make your you know, granulocytes, your red blood cells, your platelets, and the lymphoid stem cell. The lymphoid stem cell is the one that makes lymphocytes. So that's this one here, the lymphoid stem cell. Then what happens is the lymphoid stem cell will become two different types of, of lymphocytes. Like kinda, one is it's gonna become what's called a precursor T cell. So we'll call it a precursor T cell. And then here, we're gonna have a B cell, but this is called a precursor B cell. Now, the precursor T cell is going to be very naive. It doesn't really know what it wants to be when it grows up. <laughs> okay, so it has to go to the thymus. The thymus has a lot of different thymic cells and B cells there that are gonna help to mature and differentiate these naive or precursor T cells into functional T cells. And it comes out of the thymus with two particular types of cells. One is it can become a T cell that expresses a very specific type of protein on its surface. And what are those? Let's say here in blue, we, crawl, we have this protein here. And then here in red, we'll have this other protein. And this is really what kind of differentiates the T cells. So here in blue, we're gonna have what's called the CD4 positive proteins. And here in red, we'll have the CD8 positive proteins. And this will kind of determine which types of cells we have. If it's CD4 positive, we call this T helper cells. So we call these T helper cells. If it's the CD8, it's primarily C cytotoxic T cells. So that's kind of the big difference. Now what happens is these cells, they can move through the blood, but also collectively they can go and kind of infiltrate into the lymph node and stay in the lymph node. Now, when we talked about Hodgkin's lymphoma, we didn't discuss anything about T cell types of Hodgkin's lymphoma. We said it was primarily B cell. In non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it is primarily B cell types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but there's very few cases, very few, and we're gonna briefly talk about it here, in which you can have what's called a T cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This accounts for maybe 10 to 15% of the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 85 to like, you know, pretty much 90% of the actual cases of non-Hodgkin's are B cell, which we'll spend most of the time talking about. But of these, there is some type of problematic issue when these cells are supposed to come here, these T cells are supposed to come here 
and kind of lay their groundwork here in the lymph node, they undergo some type of mutation process. And when they undergo this type of mutation, they can end up kind of replicating and proliferating some way in shape or form in the lymph nodes and the blood and in the skin tissues. So those are the three different areas, the blood, the lymph nodes, and the skin tissues. But this type we call T-cell lymphoma. And the primary cause which is believed to be associated with this, since we're already talking about it, is believed to be associated with the human a T cell lymphotropic virus. For some particular reason, it may produce some type of mutation within these T cells and lymph nodes and cause them to proliferate in some particular way. But that's the really, really rare one. We're not gonna spend a ton of time talking about this one. We're gonna talk a lot about the B cell types. Now, if you guys remember, what happens is, this precursor B cell is kind of naive, if you will. So if we think about it here, it's kind of moving through the blood. It hasn't been exposed to any type of antigen yet. So we can also call this precursor B cell, we can call it a naive B cell. And what that means, it has not been exposed to any antigens yet. What happens is, it can then move into this particular zone here. Right? And in one way, maybe it moves into the zone and stays there, doesn't get exposed to any antigens, or maybe it moves into this zone and it gets exposed to a particular antigen. Because you know on these B cell surfaces, they have what's called B cell receptors. They're like little antibodies and they attach to different antigens. That's what happens in this zone here. You know what this zone is called here? This zone here? This zone here is called the mantle zone. It's called the mantle zone. So in this zone is where antigens should generally either be exposed to an, uh, whether these B cells either get exposed to an antigen or don't get exposed to an antigen. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna kinda put this guy here, and I'm gonna put on its surface here, we're gonna have this cell here, this is our naive B cell. This is our naive B cell. They're both gonna have these B cell receptors on them. They're both gonna have these B cell receptors. If it gets exposed to an antigen, it then becomes a very different type of cell. From this point, it says, oh, I've recognized this antigen with my B cell receptor. Here it has not. If there's antigen exposure, then what it does is, it says, okay, I've upgraded. I can move into the germinal center of this lymph node. Because really what we're doing is, when we talk about what all is happening here, all we're talking about is here's our lymph node. Here's the efferents, the afferent lymphatic vessels, and then you have your trabriculae. And then really what we're doing is we're looking at this kind of follicle and we're zooming in on it here. That's where all these B cells are infiltrating into. When they go into the mantle zone of this, they should be good, exposed to an antigen. If they're exposed to an antigen, they'll move in here. If they don't become exposed to the antigen, they kind of just stay in the mantle zone in this naive phase. Once they go into the germinal center and they've had antigen exposure, so we're gonna put this as antigen exposure at this point. Then it goes in, it gets a little bit bigger. It gets a little bit bigger, okay? And what it does is, at this stage, is it starts changing a little bit of its actual B cell receptor. So it maybe changes one of the variable portions of it a little bit. Just makes it a little bit different so it can bind onto a variety of different types of antigens. So what is this big sucker here called? This is called a centroblast. It's called a centroblast. Now, what happens with the centroblast, we said, first thing, you have this naive B cell that either gets exposed to the antigen or it doesn't. So it kind of has this like little bifurcation pathway. If it goes here and it stays without any antigen exposure, we actually call this a mantle cell lymphocyte. Okay, if it gets exposed to the antigen, then we say, hey, we can now move this guy into the next stage to become a centroblast. Goes into the germinal center here, and then what happens is it kind of changes the little variable regions on the B cell receptor. This is called somatic hypermutation. Kind of just changes the variable regions of these B cell receptors a little bit. Then what happens is, once this kind of like cell has actually been formed, it's performed somatic hypermutation, it should start kind of dividing. So it should do something called clonal expansion. 
And what it'll do is, it'll kind of start kind of dividing and making a ton of more centroblasts. So here we're going to have a ton of centroblasts that are being formed. A ton of centroblasts that are being formed here. With all these different types of variable B cell receptors on them. Now, here's the next thing that happens. At this stage, these centroblasts, if they express these B cell receptors with their variable region, they should have to go and recognize antigens. And if they have a strong affinity for antigens, that's good. If they have no affinity for any particular type of antigen, that's bad and they should probably undergo apoptosis. So that's where we kind of diverge this pathway a little bit. And we take it here to where they may go in two different parts. One is that the cell may have to undergo apoptosis because it has no affinity for the proper antigen, so it won't do its job very well. Okay, so this means a low affinity for the antigen. Okay, it's not a good somatic hypermutation, it's not a good cell that we want. If it has good affinity for the antigen, then it moves on to the next stage. It's passed. And the centroblast then moves into this next stage here. So this is kind of like a weird lobe nucleus, but this one's kind of same thing, kind of weird lobe, a little bit smaller though. This one is called a centrocyte. So what is this one called here? This one is called a centrocyte. Now, the centrocyte will have all these like perfect B cell receptors which have good affinity for antigens. They've already passed that step of somatic hypermutation. They've already you know, had good testing for the actual antigen. They didn't undergo apoptosis because this is the pathway that they would go if they have poor affinity. They have undergo apoptosis. If they do have good affinity, then they go become centrocytes. The centrocytes then go and interact with other cells. So there's some other cells that are supposed to be in the vicinity here. So you'll have one cell which is called a T cell, and you'll have another one which is called a dendritic cell. And what these are supposed to do is, is they're supposed to properly interact with this centrocyte. They're supposed to properly interact with the centrocyte and trigger the centrocyte to decide, hey, what are you going to become? Are you going to become a memory B cell? Or are you going to become a plasma cell? Because you need to figure out at this point right here. And at this point right here where it decides what it's going to do, this is called class switching. And basically all that means is it kind of determines which kind of antibodies it's going to produce. Maybe it switches it up to like IgA and IgG, et cetera, types of antibodies. So at this point here, the T cells and the dendritic cells are really helping with this process of the centrocyte, determining this process of class switching and getting ready to differentiate. So then once it passes this stage, it moves into this zone here. It moves into this zone here. And this zone here is called the marginal zone. So what is this zone here called? This is called the marginal zone. So these lymphocytes would be the marginal zone lymphocytes. Once it moves here, it finally will undergo differentiation. When it undergoes this differentiation process, it'll turn into two different types of cells, if you will. One is it'll decide to become a memory B cell, or it'll decide to become a plasma cell. So from here, this marginal zone lymphocyte right here, this marginal zone lymphocyte, will decide to become a memory B cell, which will have these beautiful <clears throat> little B cell receptors on them, which are designed and primed to be able to recognize any type of foreign antigen because it has these nice little variable regions on there, or to become a cell that produces antibodies, that becomes an antibody producing factory. And this will become what's called a plasma blast, which will then differentiate into a plasma cell. And plasma cells are antibody producing factories. So they'll produce these antibodies that have the little kind of like small variable region on them that are primed to be able to recognize any type of foreign antigen. My friends, this is a lot of stuff and you're probably like, okay, Zach, <laughs> how, how is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma gonna fit in here? Don't worry, I got you.
along this pathway, we talked about in Hodgkin's lymphoma, it was kind of like the centroblast and centrocytes were being, getting stuck into an area where they couldn't die. That's what it was in Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? There was a lot of nuclear factor kappa beta, it was turning off the apoptosis genes and the cell was just be able to survive without dying. In these stages of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it occurs at different points. So the first one here is you can have a, basically some type of mutation that occurs at this point here. So we're going to kind of mark these and we're going to go down in a second and talk about each one. But at this point here, if this cell undergoes a particular mutation at this particular point, it can cause something called mantle cell lymphoma. If there's a mutation at some point here in the centroblast where it undergoes a mutation and continues to keep replicating or not dying, this can become different types of lymphomas. We'll talk about what's called diffuse large B cell lymphoma and Burkitt's lymphoma. And if at this point, the centrocyte, there's a mutation that occurs here, this can cause something called follicular cell lymphoma or follicular lymphoma. And then, <laughs> if there's some type of mutation that occurs in the lymphocytes at the marginal zone, this can cause something called marginal zone lymphoma. So now let's come down for a second and talk about specifically what are these different types and what are the causes or the reasons these things occur. It's actually very, very interesting. So the first thing that I wanna talk about here is going to be going over all these different types of neoplastic lymphocytes, the B cell type. We already talked about the T cell type. It was the rare type that it can occur where there's a mutation in the uh, T cell development as it goes into the lymph node with the human T lymphotropic virus. For these ones, it's a little bit different. So remember, quickly here, here was our naive B cell, the one that had not been exposed to an antigen. Here you have antigen exposure. If it exposes to the antigen, it then moves into the germinal center and becomes a centroblast. So here is our centroblast. Then it undergoes somatic hypermutation. And if it doesn't undergo apoptosis and it survives, it then becomes a centrocyte. Then the centrocyte will then differentiate in this zone called the marginal zone. And then the last thing is it'll actually differentiate and become memory B cells or plasma cells. And then really quickly, this zone right here, we said that when the naive B cell gets exposed to the antigen, it then moves from the mantle zone into the germinal center. If there's no antigen exposure, it stays here in the mantle zone. So this is your mantle cell. At each point here, there's mutations. So I'm gonna talk first about the different types of B cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in a particular way that I think will help you to remember it. So when we talk about these, I put them into two groups. One is a group where the cause of them actually having a lot of these neoplastic lymphocytes in the lymph node is decreased cellular apoptosis. And the other group here is the reason why they have tons of these neoplastic lymphocytes in their lymph nodes is because the cells are hyperproliferating. So the reason why this is important is because if cells don't die, they won't kind of proliferate, 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 proliferate. They'll just live for a, forever, for a really long time. But that means that it's not really rapid. It's not super aggressive. Instead, this is more of the types of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas that are more indolent and are slow growing. That's a really, really important thing. Whereas, if I were to take the situation here with the increased cellular proliferation, these things are proliferating so quickly that they are rapid and super aggressive. So that kind of really helps us to kind of delineate the two different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas here into which ones are very slow, indolent, and which ones are rapid and very aggressive. So now, Here's what we gotta do. We're gonna have the different stages. The first one for the decreased cellular apoptosis for the indolent, slow-growing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is follicular lymphoma and marginal zone lymphoma. So let's come back. At what stages would that be? So we said here, naive B cell goes into the mantle zone. If it doesn't get exposed to the antigen and it proliferates and replicates and it survives here, it's called marginal zone lymphoma. I'm sorry, um, mantle zone lymphoma. If it goes here, it becomes a centroblast. We said any kind of mutations here, the centroblast would be diffuse large B cell lymphoma or would be what else? Burkitt's lymphoma. 
If we go to the centrocyte and there's mutations there, this gives way to follicular lymphoma. And if there's a mutation that occurs in the mantle zone, this gives way to what's called marginal zone lymphoma. So the question then comes, okay, I know follicular lymphoma is a mutation where these centrocytes are surviving. And then there's also marginal zone lymphoma is basically where the marginal zone lymphocytes are continuing to survive and not die. What are the reasons why they survive and don't undergo apoptosis? Great question. So follicular lymphoma, it's due to a chromosomal translocation. The chromosomal translocation in this part is occurring between chromosomes 14 and 18. There is a translocation at this point here. What happens is there's a very special gene that kind of gets hyperactivated. And you know what this gene is called? This gene is called, that actually kind of gets expressed here, is what's called the BCL2. So you're going to hyperactivate the expression of this molecule called BCL2. Now BCL2 is a very specific molecule that when it's hyperexpressed, it inhibits apoptosis. So the cells won't be able to die. So this will inhibit apoptosis. And if you inhibit apoptosis, you will continue to allow for the cells to become immortal and live forever. And so this basically increases your cell number because they will not die. That's one way that follicular lymphoma will occur. All right, so that's one particular problem, a 14-18 translocation, increasing the expression of this molecule here, which inhibits apoptosis. Well, I'm guessing the same thing happens here. There's no obvious kind of chromosomal translocation. But what we do know is that at some point along this structure, there's another type of gene that's hyper-expressed. And it's another BCL. It's BCL10. So there is a hyper-expression of this molecule called BCL10. And guess what BCL10 does? It basically increases the expression of nuclear factor kappa beta. That sounds familiar. And if I increase the expression of nuclear factor kappa beta, what I do is, is I remember that inhibits apoptosis. So if I inhibit apoptosis, I allow for the cells to continue to survive. So I increase my cell number. And the same thing in this particular situation, I'll increase my cell number. So this is basically how this occurs. So for these two different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that are slow, very indolent, the follicular lymphoma, the marginal zone lymphoma, for follicular, it's due to a 14-18 translocation that increased the expression of a BCL2 molecule that will inhibit apoptosis. For marginal zone lymphoma, which is basically an increased number of marginal zone cells in the marginal zone, it's due to an increase in BCL10, which inhibits apoptosis, okay? So that's a really key point here. So now we have knocked out at least at this point here, follicular lymphoma and marginal zone lymphoma. We now have to knock out the diffuse large B cell, the Burkitt's, and then the mantle cell lymphoma. Okay, so let's come over here now. So if we move over here, we move into the next part of this kind of diagram. So again, just to recap it, because it's always good to have kind of like small repetition here. Here is your naive B cell. Here it gets antigen exposure. Here there is no antigen exposure. If it stays here, it's a mantle cell lymphocyte. If it goes here after the antigen exposure, it becomes a centroblast. If it undergoes somatic hypermutation and survives, it becomes a centrocyte. If it differentiates in this zone, it becomes a marginal zone lymphocyte. And then from here, it should become a memory B cell or a plasma cell. We've already knocked out at this point the centrocyte and the marginal zone. So now we have to cover the, the centroblast and this mantle cell. There is technically another one here, but we'll briefly discuss it and that's it. So now, what happens here is we're gonna talk about mantle cell, which is there's a mutation that occurs at some point within these cells, the Burkitt's and diffuse, which occurs at some point along these cells. And then just to quickly like discuss this, I won't go too crazy, but at this point here, this cell that does get exposed to antigen, I know you guys are probably wondering, well, does something happen to that one? It does. Technically, this can lead to the formation of something that we already talked about, chronic 
lymphocytic lymphoma or small lymphocytic lymphoma. But we talked about that already. We don't need to go over this. That's it. That's all I want you to know about this is that if this actual naive B cell gets exposed to an antigen, it stays in the actual mantle zone and gets ready to go into the germinal center. If there's a mutation that occurs along that point, it can lead to CLL or small lymphocytic lymphoma. But if it's here, when it doesn't get exposed to an antigen, or it actually does and undergo somatic hypermutation, or we already kind of talked about these points, now we have to discuss these. So the first one here is we're gonna discuss the actual cells in the mantle zone that did not get exposed to the antigen. This is mantle cell lymphoma. With mantle cell lymphoma, there is a chromosomal translocation. And it occurs between chromosomes 11 and 14. And what happens is it increases the activity of a very specific type of gene. And what this gene does is, is it increases the expression of something called cyclin D. If you guys have watched our video where we talked about um, a lot of the actual cellular pathways and stuff, we kind of went over this. And basically cyclin D, what it's been shown to do is it, it works with like cyclin dependent kinases. This will help cells to go into the S phase. So S phase is where you have a lot of DNA replication. So this will basically try to trigger cell proliferation. That's really all it's gonna to try to do. It's gonna to try to increase cell proliferation because it'll help to push this cell into what's called the S phase quicker. And if you increase cellular proliferation, you're gonna increase your cell number. It's just you'll increase your cell number very quickly and rapidly, and that will be a rapid aggressive tumor. Okay, so that's mantle cell lymphoma. That's at this point here. So if this cell that does not get exposed to an antigen that's in the mantle zone becomes mutated at this point, this 11, 14, translocation, increase the expression of cyclin D, causes increased cellular proliferation, it can cause mantle cell lymphoma. If it's of the centroblast, so here we have mantle cell lymphoma, here at this point, if it occurs at the centroblast stage, this can give you two different types. One is Burkitt's lymphoma, and the other one is diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So here at this point here, we talked about, I can give you what's called mantle cell lymphoma, Burkitt's lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Now, Burkitt's lymphoma, it's at the centroblast stage. This is due to a chromosomal translocation between eight, chromosome eight and chromosome 14. And what it does is, is it increases the expression of a very specific nasty molecule called CMYC. And this is basically a super hyperactive kind of proto-oncogene. And when you hyperactivate this puppy, whoo, this causes massive cellular proliferation. So it'll cause the cells to proliferate very, very quickly. And you will increase the number of your cells very rapidly. The big thing to remember with this is that there's believed to be some type of trigger associated with this one. Especially, especially Epstein-Barr virus and HIV. This, these patients um, who have Burkitt's lymphoma, especially the African, so there's different types. There's the African population, and then there's the ones that are in the non-African population. In the African population, EBV, HIV positive patients have a high risk of Burkitt's lymphoma. It may kind of increase the activity of this tr chromosomal translocation. The next one is diffuse large B cell lymphoma. This one is the most common. So I want you to remember one thing. This is the most common type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So out of all the B-cell types of lymphoma, this is the most common type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the reason why is I didn't talk about it, but diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, it can occur here at the centroblast stage. It can also occur here, what's called the plasma blast stage, and it can occur at other areas as well. But it is the most common one. But what I want you to know about this one is, there's no specific chromosomal translocation. We just know that on chromosome number three, on chromosome number three, there's this increased expression of a very specific molecule called BCL6. I know I've hit a lot of these. So follicular was BCL2. Marginosome was BCL10. Diffuse large B cell lymphoma is BCL6. And I, I know this sounds crazy, like why do I need to know this? It's gonna come in play when we get into the diagnostics again. So we'll recap this as well then, because I know it's probably getting a little tough. But if we increase the number of BCL6, what happens is it does the same thing. It increases your cellular proliferation, it acts like kind of a proto-oncogene type of activity.
And if you increase cellular proliferation, you will increase your cell number. The thing is, is that this is not the only one with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. There's actually thoughts that diffuse large B-cell lymphoma could be associated with increased BCL2, which caused inhibition of apoptosis. There's other genes like the P53 gene that are believed to have a mutation in. So there could be also associations, not just with BCL6, but if you want to add in here, it may also affect things like BCL2 and P53. But remember that these are anti-apoptotic genes. So they basically will try to inhibit apoptosis and allow for the cell to continue to survive. So you may have a combination of all these, but I'd rather you remember specifically the BCL6, okay? Now, another thing to add on here is that diffuse large B-cell lymphoma has a very high association with EBV, but especially, especially HIV positive patients. So these are another thing that these mutations may be set, uh, affected by these particular viruses. So again, the big thing to remember for the rapid aggressive types of B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma type is that it could be due to mantle cell lymphoma. Mantle cell lymphoma is the cell that basically has no antigen exposure and sits in the mantle cell zone, but replicates, replicates, replicates because of a 11, 14 translocation, which increases cyclin D, which increases cellular proliferation. Burkitt's lymphoma is a mutation that occurs in the centroblast stage, and diffuse large B cell lymphoma is a mutation that occurs in the centroblast stage. The difference is, for Burkitt's, it's 8, 14 which causes an increase in C, MYC. For diffuse, it's chromosome three that increased the expression of BCL6. Both of these increase cellular proliferation. I know that this is a lot of stuff that just happened here with non-Hodgkins, and that's why it's a tough topic. But now that we got a good idea at this point that this is the most important one to remember, you wanna know why? Again, we already talked about this a little bit, but the B cell types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma account for about 85 to 90% of the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. So if you remember these, you'll remember most of the different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And if you have the extra space, don't forget about that rare type of T cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which may be secondary to human T lymphotropic virus. You know how you get that? This actually could be a high yield thing, IV drug abuse. So don't forget that as well. But now that we've talked about this lymphocyte pathway and then the causes of how we get all these different types of neoplastic lymphocytes, now let's talk about what are the effects of having all of these neoplastic lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. Extranodal tissues are all over the body. Let's get into it. All right, my friends, so now we have a patient who we suspect has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? When we think about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we have to understand that there is a ton of these neoplastic lymphocytes, whether, whether it is mantle cell lymphoma, <clears throat> whether it's Burkitt's, whether it's a patient who has diffuse large B cell lymphoma, marginal cell lymphoma, whatever it may be at these points, they oftentimes present with these classic features because they're just proliferating or they're not dying in the lymph nodes. So whenever that happens, they just fill up these lymph nodes, whether it be because of decreased apoptosis or increased cellular proliferation. Now when that happens, you get these big old lymph nodes now. So you end up with something called lymph adenopathy. So these big old plump lymph nodes. And oftentimes they are painless, which is really, really important to remember. They are rubbery generally, but here's the big difference between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's, because both of these can present with lymphadenopathy. Oftentimes it is non-contiguous. That is actually pretty important to remember. And the reason why is, is if you guys go back and think about when we talked about patients who have Hodgkin's lymphoma, it was contiguous. So in other words, if it started at a point here, it would move to the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. If it's non-Hodgkin's, this thing can go from here to here to here. It can go wherever it wants. It doesn't continue down the chain of lymph nodes. It just moves all over the place. That's super high yield, my friend. So I need you to remember that for non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, they have a lymphadenopathy, but one of the key things here is that it is non-contiguous. Now, what are the areas that are usually affected? It tends to be the same kind of areas, cervical, supraclavicular, maybe some axillary, sometimes the mediastinal, but the mediastinal is way more common in a Hodgkin's lymphoma, but they can also involve some of the abdominal lymph nodes as well. So watch out for some abdominal lymph node involvement as well. So you can see these same kind of thing. 
you can see cervical, you could see supraclavicular, you could see axillary, and you can see mediastinal, but again, I want you guys to remember that the mediastinal, I want you to associate that more commonly with, you see this more in Hodgkin's lymphoma than you will in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And lastly, you can even see abdominal, and that's something that you don't really see in which one? You don't really see that in Hodgkin's lymphoma. So with this one, you'll see way more commonly in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma than you will in Hodgkin's lymphoma. So really, really important to remember that. Now, I have lymphadenopathy, painless, rubbery, non-contiguous, can also involve the abdominal lymph nodes, which is not common in Hodgkin's lymphoma. That's the big thing so far. The other things is when we talked about the alcohol-induced lymphadenopathy kind of pain, you don't see that in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So that's another big thing. But one of the other things that you want to remember is that these actual lymphocytes are releasing some degree of cytokines, things like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrotic factor alpha, to that effect. These are hitting the hypothalamus. And then the good old hypothalamus says, okay, time to go ahead and increase the body's temperature. So it causes things like fevers, causes things like night sweats, and it also alters things like appetite and can cause weight loss. These are features of something called B symptoms. So you can see these are what we refer to as something called B symptoms. One of the big things to remember is like, oh wait, Zach, now I'm kind of losing my mind here. I'm kind of getting confused because lymphadenopathy was common in Hodgkin's lymphoma. I get that it's contiguous in Hodgkin's, non-contiguous in non-Hodgkin's. B symptoms are, are also present in Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's, yes. But one thing to add on here is that B symptoms tend to be more common in Hodgkin's lymphoma than in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So we're starting to see some kind of differences, lymphadenopathy in both of them, contiguous in, hot, hot, non, uh, contiguous in Hodgkin's, non-contiguous in non-Hodgkin's. You see mediastinal more common in Hodgkin's. You see abdominal more common in non-Hodgkin's. B symptoms is present in both, but it's more common in Hodgkin's lymphoma. All right, my friends, so now we have a patient who comes in, they have lymphadenopathy, particular areas that we already discussed, painless, rubbery, non-contiguous, meaning it doesn't spread in a continuous manner. You may have one here and then one all the way over here, right? Or one over here and then one over here, so it doesn't spread in a continuous manner from lymph node to lymph node. Now the next thing is it, it loves to involve extranodal tissues way more than Hodgkin's lymphoma does. So remember we said extranodal involvement, way not, like very like uncommon in Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? But it is super, super, super common in comparison to Hodgkin's lymphoma. So that's why I mentioned it there, but understanding that it is way more common in this particular process. So what happens is you have these kind of like lymph node kind of tumors, if you will, and what they do is they decide to get into the bloodstream. So here you have these big chunks of like uh, neoplastic lymphocytes, and they decide to get into the bloodstream or spread via other lymphatic tissues. When they do that, maybe some of the areas that they decide to go and wreak havoc on is the central nervous system. And maybe some of these will deposit into the brain. And if they deposit into the brain, they cause something called primary CNS lymphoma. And this is very important to remember that if you have a patient who's HIV positive, very, very high risk for this one. And you can see this, the most common presentation is diffuse, large B-cell lymphoma. Usually this is the one that has the most incidence of primary CNS lymphoma, especially if the patient is HIV positive. The other thing is it can actually deposit, not, not only cause this tumor, but it can even deposit into the meninges and it may cause things like meningitis, it may even cause things like seizures as well. But one other thing, it also can deposit around the spinal cord. So if it deposits around the spinal cord, watch out for spinal cord compression. And maybe the way that they present is in something like a cauda equina syndrome. So watch out for cauda equina syndrome. This could be one of the reasons why as well that they present. Oftentimes in patients who have uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, sometimes the way that they present is due to uh, oncologic emergencies. So things like spinal cord compression or seizures or primary CNS lymphoma. All right.
The next thing is what if it actually infiltrates into the bone marrow? So now you get these kind of like neoplastic lymphocytes and they deposit into the bone marrow where you're supposed to be making a bunch of other blood cells. If this deposits into the red bone marrow, then you actually make less space. So if it deposits into the red bone marrow, it decreases the space for other cells. And now I get less <laughs> production of, oh, my poor red blood cells, they start dropping. My poor platelets, they start dropping. And maybe even other different types of white blood cells like neutrophils potentially start dropping as well. So then you get effects of pancytopenia, which is decreasing level of all cell lines. So watch out for pancytopenia. And this may present with the patient having, if they have less red blood cells, maybe anemia. So they may present with fatigue or pallor or dyspnea. If they have less platelets, they may present with bleeding or bruising. If they present with neutropenia, they may present with infections. So these are things to watch out for, okay? The other thing here is it can, <laughs> and this is the interesting one, T-cell, all right? So T-cell lymphoma. T-cell lymphoma, those T-cells, they love to deposit into the skin. So in patients who have what's called, this is actually called mycosis fungioides. And this is basically, you have a bunch of neoplastic T-cells that are accumulating in this tissue. And what they do is they form these like nasty like little plaques. So they form these skin lesions. They look like, they're, they're literally called plaques. They look like a fungus. They literally kind of look like these like nasty red fungal infection kind of appearances. So they'll present with a lot of plaques. What happens is, is sometimes these actual T cells can spread into the bloodstream. And when they spread into the bloodstream, they take on this like weird like shaped T cell. And they're called Cesare cells, Cesare cells. And these Cesare cells will go and deposit into the skin of the tissues around the body. And when it does that, it causes this intense red rash that can occur all over the entire body, a very diffuse rash. This is called Cesare syndrome. This is called Cesare syndrome. And they can literally develop what's called erythroderma. So this is called erythroderma. It's a diffuse red rash. And basically this is a feature of a T-cell lymphoma. So this is a type of manifestation that you may see in T-cell lymphoma. All right, that's an important thing to remember. So for T-cell lymphoma, look for specifically any evidence of skin plaques, nasty skin plaques, or very diffuse red rashes that can appear over the body and it's usually called Cesare syndrome because you have these like cells called Cesare cells that are circulating the blood and kind of depositing all over the skin in different areas of the body. Okay, so so far it deposits into the CNS, it deposits into the bone marrow, it deposits into the skin and causes this weird situation here. Another thing that can happen is it can deposit into glands. So if it deposits into these things, these glands, these are like, let's say that these are your salivary glands and lacrimal glands, or if it deposits into the thyroid gland, you can have a lot of problems here. So now imagine I get a clump of these lymphocytes, these neoplastic lymphocytes that accumulate here and these areas here. Now I can start seeing decreased like saliva. I can start seeing decreased, what else? Maybe lacrimal fluid. And so you can end up with dry eyes and dry mouth. So this is a really, really important thing to remember because sometimes this is associated with Chagrin syndrome, okay? The next one here is the thyroid tissue. The thyroid tissue can actually deposit into the thyroid tissue and cause an enlarged thyroid. So it may cause thyromegaly. Now a big thing to remember here, big, big thing to remember here, is that usually if these neoplastic lymphocytes deposit into the salivary and lacrimal glands or into the thyroid gland, if you see these, this is commonly associated with what's called marginal zone lymphoma.
All right, marginal zone lymphoma. Let's actually do that in black here, and then we'll highlight it up. But if you see an involvement of the salivary and lacrimal glands and the thyroid gland, this is commonly associated with marginal zone lymphoma. And if you guys remember, marginal zone lymphoma was one of those lymphomas that was usually due to an increase in BCL-10 expression. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but when I, we didn't discuss it before, but BCL-10 expression, those kind of like cells when they produce lots of BCL-10, one of the things is it actually could be due to like a chronic inflammation. Uh, so if patients have infection like H. pylori, or if they have like Chagrin syndrome or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, this can definitely cause marginal zone lymphoma because it causes a lot of inflammation which may cause mutations and increased expression of BCL-10 as we talked about before. Another one is that you can kind of get these neoplastic lymphocytes to deposit into the actual stomach. And this can cause what's called gastric malt lymphoma. And this is also extremely common in patients who have marginal zone lymphoma. So marginal zone lymphoma can be associated with gastric malt lymphoma, thyroid uh, kind of enlargement, and salivary and lacrimal gland kind of infiltration. And so that's a really, really important thing. So think about marginal zone lymphoma and patients who have a history of peptic ulcer disease. So think about this in a patient who has a history of peptic ulcer disease who has Hashimoto's or has Chagrin's. Very, very high yield because these are the things that are actually causing the increase in BCL-10. Okay, next thing, is we could deposit these lymphocytes into an area of the small bowel. You know there's an area of the small bowel here called the ileocecal valve. And what happens is if we deposit onto the ileocecal valve, it thickens the ileocecal valve. And if you thicken the ileocecal valve, if I thicken the ileocecal valve, that can call a cause a small bowel obstruction. That's another thing that you can potentially see. We usually see this in patients who have what's called Burkitt's lymphoma, but the sporadic type. So this is usually seen in what's called the Burkitt's lymphoma, the non-African type or the sporadic type. Okay, so remember Burkitt's lymphoma for ileocecal valve involvement. The other thing is we can have some of these neoplastic lymphocytes deposit into the liver or deposit into the spleen and they will cause the enlargement of the spleen and the liver. So we can call this hepato, spleno, megaly. And this may present in a lot of different ways. Maybe it presents with abdominal fullness, maybe it presents with nausea, vomiting, anorexia, but you're gonna have something like this, and this is very commonly seen with different types of lymphomas, maybe even follicular lymphoma. So you may see this with the follicular type or really all different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but one of the times that we see like a lot of it is, is in follicular lymphoma. So in follicular lymphoma, watch out for any evidence of hepatosplenomegaly, okay? Now, with that being said, I talked about a lot of different things. There's one more thing that I want you guys to remember. With the bone, we talked about how if it can infiltrate into the bone marrow, right? Let's say I put one more kind of thing here. So let's say I bring back another diagram of the bone. We can actually deposit these lymphocytes into the bone, but more specifically the bones of the jaw. So if these kind of neoplastic lymphocytes deposit into the bone, let's put bone of the jaw. It can cause a very enlarged mass of the jaw. And this is a really sad thing here. So what we can see is we can see a very large jaw mass. And this is common in a patient who has the Burkitt's lymphoma, the endemic or African type. So I want you guys to remember that this is seen in Burkitt's lymphoma, but more specifically the African subtype, the one that's associated with Epstein-Barr virus or HIV positive patients. Okay, so from this point, my friends, patient comes in, they have maybe some painless rubbery, non-contiguous lymphadenopathy, cervical, supraclavicular, axillary, abdominal, not as common in the mediastinal. Maybe they have some mild B symptoms, and then they come and they present with things like 
thyroid enlargement, maybe decreased salivary and lacrimal gland production. They have a history of Sjogren's. They have a history of Hashimoto's. They also come with like abdominal pain because of a lot of gastric invasion. This could be seen with which type? Marginal zone lymphoma. If I said, okay, I have a patient who has primary CNS lymphoma, maybe meningitis, seizures, spinal cord compression, this could be due to diffuse large B cell lymphoma. If I were to say, okay, I have one that's actually infiltrating into the bone around the maxilla and the mandible, the jaw, it causes a big old large jaw mass. This is Burkitt's lymphoma. Which type? African or the sporadic? African associated with which things? EBV and HIV. If I said that it also can involve the things like the skin and cause these nasty skin plaques that look like fungal infections, maybe even gets into the bloodstream, like a leukemia type, spreads all over the area and causes diffuse redness over the body. This can be seen with T cell lymphoma. And then again, <clears throat> if I said that there's involvement of the ileocecal valve, it causes thickening of it and causes a small bowel obstruction. This is associated with Burkitt's lymphoma, the sporadic type, not associated with HIV and EBV. And then if I also said hepatosplenomegaly, you would see this with follicular lymphoma. So these are the things that I want you to remember. Now before we go on, one of the other things I want you to understand here is some complications that you can see in non-Hodgkin's that you don't really see in Hodgkin's lymphoma. One of the big things here is that sometimes when you get these big old tumor masses, if you get like a really, really heavy tumor burden, these tumor burdens may increase the expression of an enzyme called 1-alpha hydroxylase. You know what that does? That increases the vitamin D and vitamin D increases your blood calcium levels. So one of the things that you wanna watch out for is that sometimes these patients can have hypercalcemia, but the hypercalcemia is due to the lymphoma. The other thing that you wanna watch out for is that in situations where you have a high tumor burden, the tumor cells rupture. And if they rupture, they spill out a lot of different types of molecules like potassium. They spill out things like phosphate. They spill out things like uric acid. And then because of this, and then they have low calcium. Because of this, the specifically the uric acid and then the calcium phosphates, these specific things go to the kidney. And they damage the kidney and cause an acute kidney injury. This can cause acute kidney injury. What is this called here? This is when the tumor cells rupture or lice. This is called tumor lysis syndrome. So you can also see this as another potential complication called tumor lysis syndrome. So you can see tumor lysis syndrome as one potential complication. Let's actually write this here. So tumor cell, let's actually make, write it like this, lysis, because of lots of tumor burden. So tumor cell lysis. You could have tumor lysis syndrome, which can cause an acute kidney injury or you can have lots of activation of vitamin D, which causes hypercalcemia. These are the things that I really want you to remember, my friends. Now, we still got the half of the board left to do. We have a patient that we think has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because of the lymphadenopathy, the possible B symptoms, extranodal tissue involvement, maybe they present with neuro features, maybe they present with other potential things like relating to the GIT, like abdominal pain or nausea, vomiting, Maybe they present with hepatosplenomegaly. Maybe they also present with pancytopenia, with features of pancytopenia. Maybe they present with a large jaw mass. Maybe they present with some skin lesions, all right? Or they present with like a thyroid enlargement or maybe even some type of problem with their salivary and lacrimal glands. If that's the case, you should start thinking about non-Hodgkin's and think about the potential complications such as hypercalcemia and tumor lysis syndrome. At this point, we now need to diagnose non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. All right, so we have a patient we think has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. They come in, they have some potential evidence of lymphadenopathy, they maybe have some extranodal features, maybe some B symptoms, but you're definitely seeing some lymphadenopathy, and that's gonna be one of the common features. And again, this could be cervical, supraclavicular, axillary, abdominal, less common mediastinal, but if it is mediastinal, look for that compressive symptoms, right? So maybe they have things like shortness of breath, or coughing due to compression of airways and pleura, or maybe they have compression of the pericardium causing some degree of chest pain, they have supravenous cava syndrome. So think about that as well. But regardless, if they have any lymphadenopathy with some plus or minus some B symptoms, think about taking a look at that lymph node. Because what you wanna figure out is you wanna know, is this METS? So is this lymphadenopathy, is this lymphadenopathy secondary to METS versus lymphoma? Now, once you've done that, you do the lymph node biopsy. The lymph node biopsy will then show you, okay, is it METS 
If it is, you're done. So is there's METs that are, po METs are positive? Okay, then it's metastatic cancer. It came from somewhere else. Go looking for that. Is there Reed Sternberg cells or variants like popcorn cells? If that's present, then you're done. Okay, then it's Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? And it's not this disease. It's not non-Hodgkin's. But if you do this lymph node biopsy and it shows negative Reed Sternberg cells or negative popcorn cells and negative evidence of METs, then it is likely non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that's the step that we would go with. The question then comes though, is this T cell or is this B cell? That's the question, right? I don't know which one it could be. It's likely 85 to 90% of the time, it's likely B cell, but I gotta figure that out. So this is really what the lymph node biopsy will do is it'll get me to the point of determining, okay, is it METs, Hodgkin's, or non-Hodgkin's? Then I go to the next part, which is flow cytometry. So once I've done this part here and I say, okay, I found out that I have some neoplastic cells here. So here's my neoplastic lymphocytes. But my question is here, is I know that this is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Is it B or T, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? So then that's where I have to kind of take a look specifically at the different types of cluster differentiation proteins, because that's where it differs. So if I have cluster differentiation proteins on this cell, and I have cluster differentiation proteins on this cell, they should differ in some degree. So if this is, let's say, CD3 positive, and this is CD20 positive. For the CD3 positive, this is suggestive of the T cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. If it's CD20 positive, it's suggestive of the B cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Right, so at that point, utilizing flow cytometry, I can delineate which type it is. Now, if it's the T cell type, then we know that it's probably some degree of T cell lymphoma, right? And we're not gonna go crazy down that rabbit hole. But what we will focus on, since 85 to 90% of the cases are usually B cell lymphomas, is now we have to go to this next part. Oh, it came back B cell, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. <clears throat> well, then I gotta know, is it mantle cell lymphoma? Is it diffuse large B cell lymphoma? Is it follicular lymphoma or Burkitt's lymphoma? Is it follicular lymphoma? Or is this marginal zone lymphoma? How do I tell which one it is? Because for T cell type, obviously I look for it specifically. You know how I can actually tell for T cell? Specifically, it likes to involve skin lesions. So I actually take skin biopsies. So oftentimes you'll do a skin biopsy for the T cell lymphoma, especially for the mycosis fungioides. And you'll see these things called uh, Poutrier's microabscesses. And then if you look, those T cells, they get into the blood. If you do a blood smear, you'll see those cells called Cesare cells. So that's kind of how I could look for the mycosis fungioides and the T cell kind of lymphoma. But for this one, I gotta go a little bit further because now I gotta figure out, okay, I remember mantle cell, that was like a mutation, right? So this was the, which one? Do you guys remember? So he said this was the 1114 translocation. Diffuse was the increase in BCL6. Burkitt's was which one? This was 814 translocation. So this was the 814 translocation. And then for follicular, it was a 1418 translocation. And then for marginal cell, this was an increase in BCL10. And the big thing I said here is that oftentimes, diffuse large B cell is the most common associated with HIV Epstein-Barr. Burkitt's associated with Epstein-Barr and HIV, especially the African type. And then marginal zone lymphoma is oftentimes associated with Hashimoto's, Chagrin's, or peptic ulcer disease caused by H. pylori. But that's not enough. I gotta actually find these specific problems and look at it. So let's come down for a second and talk specifically about the cytogenetics and how we actually can look for these chromosomal translocations, how we can identify the specific fusion genes on the PCR, and then also how we can actually look at these under the microscope. So if we come down here, I'm gonna take in this chunk of tissue and look at it, and I'm gonna be able to say, okay, that's not Reed Sternberg cells, that's not popcorn cells, that's not metastatic cancerous cells, this is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cells.
And then I've already delineated, okay, this is a B cell type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What I want to do next is once I've said, okay, these are CD20 positive cells, I want to know where is the actual chromosomal abnormality. So then what I do is, as I take the genetic material here, so I'm going to take the genetic material and I'm going to look at the chromosomes that are involved and I'm going to look if I actually kind of find, oh, here's that particular kind of translocation or here's that mutation, then what I'll do is I'll string out the actual DNA there and look for the specific gene that's the problematic issue here, and I'll quantify that. So I use cytogenetics to find the chromosomal translocation and PCR to find the specific gene and quantify it. Now, it was easy because we said we could differentiate the B cell types based upon the ones that are slow growing, very indolent, because they have decreased apoptosis. That was, which one? Let's see if you guys remember. It was follicular lymphoma and marginal zone lymphoma. Here, just for easy uh, <laughs> abbreviation purposes, follicular lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma. For follicular lymphoma, what was the chromosomal abnormality? It was 11, 14, translocation. The 1114 produced what specific molecule? Increase in BCL2. And the BCL2 is what led to a decrease in apoptosis. So I would use the cytogenetics to find that translocation and use PCR to quantify this gene that's overexpressed. For marginal zone lymphoma, look for this to be associated with peptic ulcer disease. Hashimoto's or Chagrin's. That is really high yield here. Look for thyroid, salivary, lacrimal gland involvement or history of peptic ulcer disease. For this one, there's no specific gene, but what we know is, is that if we do PCR, we find the increased expression of BCL10. And that is the problem here, that way we do that on PCR. So, so far, I've been able to delineate this based upon chromosomal translocation for follicular. This in the history, the peptic ulcer Hashimoto Chagrin's, which led to an increased expression of BCL10. And then for the types with increased cellular proliferation, which are the rapid, aggressive types. What were these three? There was mantle cell lymphoma, there was Burkitt's lymphoma, and there was diffuse large B cell lymphoma. If you guys remember, this was of the centrocytes. This was of the marginal zone cells. This was of the mantle cells, and these were of the centroblasts. For the mantle cell lymphoma, this was which one? This was going to be associated with, for this one, actually follicular, I apologize, this should be 1418. This should be 1418. The mantle cell lymphoma should be 1114. So this should be 1114 translocation. And what this does is, this increases the expression of cyclin D. And if you increase the expression of cyclin D, that'll increase cellular proliferation. So if I go through, I do the cytogenetics, I'll find the 1114 translocation. And then if I do the PCR, I'll find the increased expression of the cyclin D gene. For Burkitt's lymphoma, I'm going to find an 814 translocation. And that will lead to an increase in what? What specific molecule? The C MYC gene. So C MYC gene, and that causes excessive cellular proliferation. So I would do the cytogenetics to find this chromosomal translocation, and I would do the PCR to quantify that particular gene. And then the last thing, or I also added on here, Burkitt's lymphoma, you can have sporadic, which is non-EBV, non-HIV associated, or you can have the endemic African type, which is EBV, HIV presence, same thing for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It's heavily involved in EBV and HIV. But for this one, there's no specific trone translocation. It's just chromosome number three increases the expression of BCL6. And with the increased expression of BCL6, we get increased cellular proliferation. So ways that we can determine which B cell type it is. So we've said, okay, it's the B cell. Which one is it? We kind of go to this next step here and we say, okay, let's look at the cytogenetics. Let's look at the PCR that may be able to elucidate the obvious ones like follicular lymphoma with the 1418, or we may be able to recognize the mantle cell with the 1114 
and Burkitt's with the 814, and then we can use PCR to find the specific genes. For the other ones, like marginal zone and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which there's no obvious chromosomal translocation, you may be able to use PCR to find the expression of these increased expression of these genes. But other ways that we can determine this is by looking at histopathology. So we can look at these genes, but we can also look at the histopathology. And so what I want you guys to do here for a second is take a look at what does follicular lymphoma histopathology look like? It looks like this. What does marginal zone lymphoma's histopathology look like? It looks like this. What does mantle cell lymphoma's histopathology look like? It looks like this. What does Burkitt's lymphoma histopathology look like? This is, it looks like this. It's also really important to remember that oftentimes we call that the starry sky appearance for Burkitt's lymphoma. And lastly, if we look at the histopathology of diffuse large B cell lymphoma, it looks like this. So at this point, we have taken a patient who we had lymphadenopathy for. We discerned that they had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma based upon the biopsy. We determined if it was B or T cell with flow cytometry. And then we used cytogenetics and PCR and histopathology to determine the type of B cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma they have. Once we've done that, we then can say, okay, has it spread to areas of the body that we don't want it to, like extra nodal tissues? How do I determine that? Let's go talk about that. All right, my friends, so now we move on to the staging. So we have diagnosed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, specifically whatever type it may be, off of what we just discussed. At this point, we have to determine, okay, has it spread to extra nodal tissues? And again, it's important to go back. I know it was a lot of stuff, but did it spread to areas of the GIT, so that gastric malt lymphoma, did it spread to the thyroid, the salivary glands? All of those three were associated with, which one? marginal zone lymphoma that is spread to the bone marrow. So in, in pretty much any type can spread to the bone marrow, but it also did it spread to the bone of the jaw, like the maxilla and the mandible, that's associated with Burkitt's. Did it spread to the actual brain, that's associated with the free large B cell lymphoma, especially if they're HIV positive. Did it spread to other areas like the spleen, the liver, which you can see in follicular lymphoma prominently. So you get the point, has it spread to other areas of the body? How do we determine if it did do that? We can do something called a PET CT scan. And what we do is, we give the patient, so we take, we're assuming that this has gotten to the blood, and then from here it's spread to multiple different areas of the body, where it deposits into the liver, it deposits into the spleen, the GIT, maybe even to the pleura, the pericardium, which you can also see as potential complications. If it's spread into the pleura, what could you get? Pleural effusions. If it's spread into the pericardium, you can get pericardial effusions. You can even get tamponade potentially. It's rare, but it's possible. If that happens, I want to know how, did it, how can I discern if it's spread? A PET CT scan, where I use something called fluorodeoxyglucose, will light up all the areas that the tumor cells have spread to. Another alternative that you can do here is I could do something called a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis with contrast, particularly IV contrast, and that'll also light up these areas. But these are the two particular tests that I would want to consider to look to see if it's spread to other areas of the body besides the brain and the bone marrow. If it's spread to the central nervous system, I first want to see, is the patient HIV positive and do they have any neuro deficits or symptoms? If they do, I want to do a MRI of the brain and I want to do an LP of the actual cerebrospinal fluid to see if I can find those neoplastic lymphocytes. So that's another thing that I would want to consider is an MRI to look for any primary CNS lymphoma or an LP to look for any meningitis or any invasion of the meninges and the cerebrospinal fluid. The other thing is I want to know, did it invade the bone marrow? So one of the ways I can invade the bone marrow is I could see pancytopenia, so dropping all the cell lines. But I could also just take a bone marrow biopsy, and if I do a bone marrow biopsy, I would find all these different types of neoplastic lymphocytes. So a bone marrow biopsy. So these are the ways that I can determine if it's spread to other areas of the body. So in other words, is there extra nodal involvement? Okay? Now, at this point, we can then say, okay, I've determined which, I've determined if it's non-Hodgkin's, if it's B or T, 
which type of B cell it is, and then I determine if it has extranodal involvement. From there, I can stage this patient. I can use something called the an arbor staging system. When we use this system, what we do is we have stage one, two, three, and then the last one, oh man, you're never gonna be able to guess this one, guys. It's stage four. I thought that was a big shocker. But with all of these stages, we have lymph node involvement. So if there is maybe one lymph node region here, that's stage one. If there's maybe two plus lymph node regions, but they're on the same side of the body, this is stage two, or I'm sorry, on the same side of the diaphragm. If there's stage three, it's two plus lymph node regions, but maybe they're involved in both sides of the diaphragm. So now I have both sides of the diaphragm. And then stage four is I have two plus lymph node regions. They could be anywhere they please, right? So they could be on both sides, they could be on different sides, but I also have extra nodal involvement. So maybe the liver, maybe I have it of the spleen. Let's just draw the spleen in there as well. But you get the point, there's been invasion of other areas. If there's invasion of other areas, that's extra nodal involvement, and that is stage four. At this point, that'll help me to determine which is their stage, but then I add on a subclassification system. So there's also a subclassification, so a sub classification. And I'll give you guys an example here in a second. But what we do with this one is we kind of divvy this out into three parts. A, B, X. So A is the absence of B symptoms, B is the presence of B symptoms, and X is the presence of bulky disease. What the heck does that mean? So the presence of bulky disease, I mean, you got a, like a, a tumor in one of the lymph nodes, and that sucker is greater than 10 millimeters, um, or I'm sorry, 10 centimeters. So if it's A, it's negative, B symptoms. B is there's positive B symptoms. You guys remember what the B symptoms were? Fevers, night sweats, weight loss. Not as common with non-Hodgkin's though. And then X is you have a lymph node that's greater than or equal to 10 centimeters. This is bulky disease. So let's give you an example to kind of make sense of this. Here I have a patient who has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. They have two lymph node regions that are present on both sides of the diaphragm. Okay, if it's on both sides of the diaphragm, that's three. The next thing is, we also move on to say, okay, with a lymph node that is, so they actually have, and B symptoms. Oh, okay, so this is stage three. Let's actually write this out, stage three. Why is it stage three? Two lymph node regions on both sides of the diaphragm. B symptoms, that's B, with a lymph node that is approximately 15 centimeters in diameter and involvement of the spleen and the bone marrow. We gotta come back now. So it's not three, and you wanna know why it's not three? I have extra nodal involvement, spleen, bone marrow involvement. So that's actually stage four. So this is stage four, presence of B symptoms, B, and the lymph node size is approximately 15 centimeters. That's greater than 10 centimeters, BX. Oh, that's a terrible stage. So that's stage four BX for this patient who has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. At this point, we have diagnosed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We've been able to stage it. Now, the reason why we need to know how to stage it is because it determines how aggressively we'll treat these patients. Let's talk about the treatment. All right, my friends, we finally made it to the treatment. Now, the treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, thank goodness, it's relatively straightforward. Remember in like Hodgkin's, there was the two alternatives, so like stage one, stage two, you would do the ABVD, the adriamycin, also known as doxorubicin, bleomycin, the vincristine, and you would also do things like procarbazine. And then if they maybe had stage three, four, we could repeat that six times, or we could do the BACOP regimen, the bleomycin, the atoposide, again, the adriamycin, also known as doxorubicin. We had the cyclophosphamide, the oncovin, also known as vincristine, prednisone, and then again, uh, we had the, uh, the, the other option there, which is the procarbazine. Now, in these particular scenarios, it's actually one regimen for the most part. You start off with systemic chemotherapy for regardless of which type of you know, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that you have. Now, with the exception, then I'm gonna put like a little kind of like a posture, or like a hyphen here, R-CHOP is the mnemonic. So it's ABVD for stage one, two Hodgkin's, and then be a cop for stage three, four Hodgkin's. For non-Hodgkin's, it's R-CHOP, okay? So this is for rituximab. 
but I got to be really particular here because rituximab is a, it's a great drug to give, but the patient has to be CD20 positive B cells. In other words, this has to be a very specific type of B cell lymphoma that has to have CD20 positive cells because it's targeting that CD20. So that's one particular option. The next one is C. So this is going to be for cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide. The other one is H. So this is actually hydroxy donorubicin, or it could also just be donorubicin. There's another one which is called Oncovin, but remember, Oncovin is the brand name. The actual generic name is called Vincristine. And the last one here is actually going to be prednisone, but it's important to remember that this can be prednisone, but it can be really any type of steroid, prednisolone, dexamethasone, you just want to remember that it's going to be steroids in the regimen. This would generally be the regimen that you would put on some, for someone who has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and hopefully it'll kill those actual lymphocytic cells. Now, the next step here is intrathecal chemotherapy. Whenever a patient who has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is HIV positive, so if they are HIV positive, or they have primary CNS lymphoma, we should do intrathecal chemotherapy, whether it be prophylaxis if they're HIV positive or whether they actually have the disease. Generally in intrathecal chemotherapy, what we do is, we can do this via like a lumbar drain, or we can do this via kind of like a catheter here. We're squirting into the ventricles, into the cerebrospinal fluid, something called intrathecal methotrexate. So we use something called intrathecal methotrexate. And again, this is specifically because one of the potential problems that we worry about with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, especially which type? Diffuse large B-cell lymphoma may potentially spread to the brain and cause this primary CNS lymphoma, this tumor here. So that's one of the big, big fears that we have to have with this particular disease. Okay, so intrathecal chemotherapy, again, we would do this as a prophylaxis in HIV positive patients or if they have primary CNS lymphoma. Because again, you can see this with spreading of diffuse large B cell lymphoma into the brain. So the last one here is marginal zone lymphoma. So marginal zone lymphoma, what I really want you to remember is, is that this was associated with which three disorders? One is, you can see this in peptic ulcer disease, which is secondary to H. pylori. You can see this in Hashimoto's and you can also see this in Chagrin syndrome. So these are autoimmune diseases. So you can see this in autoimmune diseases and you can also see this in peptic ulcer disease due to H. pylori. Remember, in these, you could have Hashimoto's and thyromegaly. Chagrin's, you could have a lot of lacrimal salivary gland involvement as well and lymphocytic kind of in deposition here. With this one, you can get gastric malt lymphoma. This is the really big one. So this is the big one that I want you to think about. Sometimes you can get these neoplastic lymphocytes that accumulate here due to lots of inflammation because basically you get a lot of inflammation in these diseases. The inflammation then triggers an increase in the expression of BCL, which one? Do you guys remember? 10. And that basically led to the evasion of apoptosis. So if you guys remember that led to inhibition of apoptosis. So you probably think, oh, this patient's gotta get chemo. Actually, it's really weird. It's one of the few where if you treat their underlying disease, if you treat their H. pylori, in other words, the cause is the inflammation. And the inflammation is being caused by this dang bug here, the H. pylori. If I eradicate the H. pylori, I eradicate the inflammation, I eradicate this hyperexpression of BCL10, and I eradicate apoptosis, and I prevent this gastric malt lymphoma. So again, this all leads to what's called a gastric malt lymphoma. How do I treat H. pylori? Do you guys remember? We would give them clarithromycin. You're like, wait, I'm giving antibiotics to a cancer? Yes. And then you're also giving amoxicillin. Because if you treat the actual problem here, you can break, you prevent this continuous actual uh, apoptotic pathway from being inhibited and prevent the actual progression of gastric malt lymphoma. So this is one of those rare situations, so it's important to be able to remember that. Also, if you guys want to remember, this is technically part of the CAP therapy. You don't need to know this, but also 
because you get peptic ulcer disease, you can put them on a PPI. So we call this the CAP therapy for H. pylori. But in this video, my friends, we have covered in detail non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time. Thank you.